Hello, welcome back to that podcast. Podcast with me, Peter Crouch, uh, Chris Stark, and Statman Dave are with me. Um, how have we been? Good week. Very good. Yes, we're back in the uh, Brewdog Pub uh, that we've been doing the podcast so from for the that's last cool. couple. That's a fully grown woman, isn't it? Just went down the slide. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we need to. We do need to talk about the slide because I, I can now have done it a few times. I've gone down it at pace, mm. and I uh, nearly injured myself. Yeah, I know the technique now. Do you? Yeah. It's just a. It's a. I think it's a tuck and right. It's a tuck, isn't it? Like if you go straight down, it's a, You got to tuck yourself in like a like a bobslayer. Yeah. I I'd think, really pin down. I think it should become our. Top Gear fastest lap kind of thing. It should be, there should almost be a timer thing at the start and the end of it because it's quite a long slide mm, it's where it, it's like you go through, bam, who can, and then chalk it up on the side if you're quicker. I think we might need like a little bit of a, you know, two to three meters as well. We've got to hit another buzzer to stop it. So That's you go idea. down, you yeah. fly through, bang. you get back up and bang, bang, bang. bang. Yeah. Okay, nice. Next time I want to lube myself up fully. <laughs> I want to go down like I want, like duck fat. Yeah, like, yeah. or whatever it is that they yeah, do. Yeah, lube it up. I'm going to be so slippery to touch. <laughs> and this thing, it's going to be like I've been given, the slide gives birth to me. Oh, yeah, the yeah, way yeah. I want to exit this slide. Oh, why would you could shoot out into the bowling alley? Mate, I'm going for like, I'm going for speed on the next one. I want Fair one of them little bobsleigh hats <laughs> and I want to be smooth. I'm going to get like totally, unless they've, you fancy doing this actually because it I, look, I have good you as well. I think I've got natural technique with these things. I like going fast, obviously qualified ski instructor. I like the pace. I instantly tucked, went down, flew down. So I think we could set a world record. The thing is, you're a bit too hairy. You're a bit too tall, and I'm a little bit too fat at the moment. <laughs> yeah, but what we think? need is is a listener that's basically like an otter that we could throw down. <laughs> Graham Otter. <laughs> if that's you, please get in touch with the podcast. Graham, we're looking for Graham Otter to break our slide speed record. Get in touch if you've got slippery skin. Yeah, yeah, it'd be good to make it competitive. That's the only thing I'd say about this place. It's fun, but there's no element of competition around no, it. No, it's not. It's not. The people are just enjoying themselves. Yeah. Well, load of bollocks. <laughs> Have you had to compete in Sports Day yet? That was something that was on my mind. Yeah, I lost, Did didn't I? I was a Premier League player. I lost on Sports Day. Yeah, but I'm saying dad's it's race. the summer. Surely you're due another dad's race sometime yeah, soon. Yeah, I'm due one. I mean. I, I, it, I'll be honest with you, not my confidence. It's a little bit. Are you pulling out? No, no, no. It just I haven't done one since because obviously losing to a dad um, with chinos on uh, whilst I was a Premier League player is not it's not a good look for a, no. for a highly tuned athlete. How did that happen, mm. Crouchy? Fast dad. He is incredibly fast. He had the knees up. It was just... And, and you know what? It was one of those where I got off to a flying start and then he just powered through. Also, uh, he didn't hang around at the end, did he? Crouchy doesn't know who his dad is. Like, it's he's done the race and then almost at the finish line, carried on and gone home. Which made us think for a while, Dave, that actually what he was doing, he was going from school to school uh, just for the dad's races and kind of... <laughs> Going in, doing the race, and then shooting off. But, Crouchy, what happens if we yeah. take this further? We've spoke about you and walking, and I think you've got the build to be one of the fastest walkers mm. on the planet. What about you slow it down, walking race? Yeah, we're going to do that, aren't we? We'll have a, we'll have a walking race, me v Sids. Steve Sidwell has laid down a, a claim that he could beat Crouch in a walking race. So the plan is, uh, currently, Dave, that we're thinking of doing it at Crouch Fest. To build up to that, what about, you know, in the parents' event, you suggest walking and you can practice um, it's not a sport, is it, Dave? Let's be honest. <laughs> it is a sport. <laughs> it's just not, though, is it? It's not. I think that's a little harsh myself. I think if you're a professional walker and you pride yourself on this is what you train for, and this is why you rightly drew heat on it, it is a respected sport. It's in the Olympics. Mm. Did you never Fair fancy enough. doing that, by the way? Did you get, did well, you ever get the... asked to do the Olympics? Well, no, it only really came in towards the end, didn't it, where like professional yeah. footballers were, were playing football? Yeah. Like it wasn't, it was, we had one GB team, didn't we? I don't know how you feel about it because I mean ultimately it's brilliant to win a gold but if you even if you'd entered if, and you chose Champions League World Cup gold medal in some sports gold medal is the absolute elite yeah. if you look at South America though they do see that like they Messi see, had that yeah. that play. situation do with they? Guardiola yeah. at the start yeah. where he wanted to go and play for Argentina Ooh, to win the gold it. I think it's probably more of a European thing where we kind of look down on it in a sense. I think it's it is for Brazil, for Argentina, that kind of like track to win the World mm. Cup. But it's only in football, isn't it? That we, it's like there's bigger competitions in football. Yeah. But I think we're getting there to that stage where you know, because it's, it's, I mean, it's imagine you're sitting here, Olympic gold winner, like it'd be it'd be phenomenal, you know, unless you were you were walking. Yeah. <laughs> also, potential um, easy route to a, an OBE. Simple. Uh, 
or a knighthood. Oh, yeah. There's, I mean, there's loads of medalists can out I, there with just, all the MBEs and all that that don't deserve them. <laughs> just very quickly, can I get your take on this, right? Um, <laughs> Bex is absolutely gagging for a knighthood, right? <laughs> but I kind of get the vibe that if you... It's like if you parch it too much or ask too much, you won't get given one. You've got a, you've got a step away. You've you parched got a, too much. Are you saying to me that David Beckham is parching? I think he's for a knighthood. I think he's gagging for a knighthood, and they're purposefully more than that. I think he has every reason to get one, and they're purposefully going. Not <laughs> <laughs> when they're in that meeting, have you seen his? Have you seen this post there? Look. <laughs> He's it's, chewed for 12 hours. <laughs> he hasn't had a sip of hydration for eight years. <laughs> How's he not got a knighthood yet? The royal family, you know, they're not into parching. I wish we'd asked. Not into it. I wish we'd asked if it's a private family joke. No, oh, they, they, they must be sitting around at Christmas going, and have a look at this. <laughs> Another year. <laughs> and they do, I, We've done him again. <laughs> <laughs> right, what's today's episode about? Today's episode is about uh, send, getting sent off. Mm. Um, red cards. You know, it's the, the, the worst way to end a football match. You know, losing matches, um, of course, awful. Um, but on a personal level, if you get sent off and you lose the match, it just feels like it's entirely your fault. Especially if it's, I don't know, in a massive Champions League game. Oh, in a massive Champions League game, I've been sent off in games um, where the next game is to stay up. Um, I've been sent off in terrible situations. I've been sent off about five times, and it, it's not it's not ideal. I've I've done some bad tackles. I've done some stupid things. Um, but you live and you learn. We've got it all on the laptop, which is the great news. We can review all of them. Interesting. Interesting all right. Stuff well, listen, we we'll dig down that. in all of that, but uh, I just want to keep you updated, uh, Chris and Dave here. Uh, on actually a message here from Luke. Uh, this is a Josie Enrique update. He says, so our work party is currently scheduled for the 24th of June, starting at a nearby beach with a free bar for a few hours. Great to help uh, with any pre-match nerves before heading to Torquay for the main event. Now, I haven't told anyone I was the chosen winner as ex uh, except a friend who also listens to the pod. Even my girlfriend has no idea. So he's kept this a secret. I just told her I got an email from the pod and that was it. When the stuff arrives, I'll keep it hidden as she's heading out to a bottomless brunch that, that, that night <laughs> for a friend's birthday. <laughs> Some weekend this, fucking hell. Wow. Go, goes off in Torquay. Uh, she'll be heading to the same club that we will be in. Wow. Fully expecting to bump into me at some stage in the evening. What she won't be expecting, though, is to bump into me mid-Enrique experience. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> wow. Can't wait for a reaction, especially to the shoes. So not only will I be surprising my workmates when I rock up, rock up as Enrique, I'll also be surprising my girlfriend and her mates later in the evening. Uh, then after, we'll see where the Enrique experience takes me. <laughs> Very intrigued to hear any prod references from fellow listeners during the night and to be the first in a long line of mere mortals getting an experience of a, a lifetime behind the velvet rope wow. for one night as Jose. Okay. It's a true honour. Uh, right. What so there's, an email, There's quite by a way. bit to unpack. Brilliant email. Yeah, too right. Too right. I, Brilliant email. So, look, if you haven't heard this podcast before, welcome along. Um... Very quick summary of this uh, this sort of story, if it um, if you want to call it that. So we acquired uh, Jose Enrique's shoes. Uh, they're very Larry. They're like these Gucci. What would you describe them as Gucci? Um, yeah, they're like Gucci dancing shoes, Gucci silver dance. patent kind of yeah spanglish dancing shoes. So we basically said if you can give them a good night out, we'll also throw in a, a sort of signed Ted Lasso shirt from Ted Lasso himself. And you can put the two together, go and have a good night, um, and we'll we'll pick up some of the expenses of that night. And Luke is going to be the first person to give this a go. What's amazing is the fact that he's gonna kind of house his girlfriend a bit because our plan is to get Luke into some little VIP area in whatever club in Torquay he mm. wants to go to. And and we'll try and get him looked after. But what would be great is when the girlfriend arrives, my first question to you boys, should the girlfriend be allowed in that VIP 100% area? 100% no. That's what I think. Yeah, yeah 100% no. I was, I, you know, I'm glad you asked me because it was in my head. I was going to bring it up next. Um, the Jose Enrique experience is for him and his pals, right? <laughs> and when she turns up and shit, honestly, when there'll be loads of women dying to get in the, behind the velvet rope <laughs> to get one glimpse at Jose. <laughs> 
keep her away. Look, I don't want to... Uh, they, I'm sure they're happy in their relationship and everything, but just for the aesthetics, Maybe it would be minutes. great if there was a bevy of... Um, scantily clad, clad ladies. Scantily <laughs> clad ladies around <laughs> Luke. I also think we could go a step further... Get a picture printed up on the wall of a, a, you can't come into the VIP area for security. So we know who she is. She yeah. can't enter, you know, clear instructions. But I think what he does, he sits there in his booth like Tony Soprano and he just invites who he wants yeah. in to join him. Yeah. It sounds to me that the um, the girlfriend's going to have a great time at Bottomless Brunch anyway. We're just, as a podcast, we, look, we, we you know, do something lovely for your wedding when you get married eventually. Just let him have one night as a Marie Kay. Right? <laughs> just let him have one night where, yes, he'll be in the VIP, and yes, he's going to be <laughs> extremely popular that night. But it's going to be one night only, it's let's one, face it. It's, it's not... The, the next day... He'll be, back, he'll be back to Luke the next day. Yeah, the, the Enrico shoes come off, <laughs> the Ted Lasso shirts <laughs> come off at night. You, you know, we'll let you be there at the three-star hotel, okay? Um, like Cinderella. So you're going to get treated like an absolute princess. <laughs> like Cinderella, isn't it? The moment he takes off the Enrico shoes, yeah. he's just, you know... Give him one Luke night. <laughs> Give him one night with his pals. To be full, full Enrique. Full Jose. Okay, great. Mm. Well, Luke, that's going to be awesome. Can't wait for that to happen. So, that, according to what you just read there, that's 24th of June that that's happening. Uh, I believe so, yeah. 24th of June, he wants wow. to do it. Uh, so, hopefully, we'll crack on with the organisation. So, that's really soon. Is there anyone that we need to ask to get involved in this crowd? Uh, we'll deal yeah. with the club and the hotel and everything. Yeah, I'm just thinking, oh, if you're like a local journalist, um, you know, from the Torquay Express or whatever, you know, the, the, the Torquay News, uh, you want to, you know, get involved in this. Uh, it might be a local kind of paparazzi down in Torquay. Oh, um, you know, because <laughs> it's not often you get someone of, of Jose Enrique's calibre down there, do you know what I mean? So it'd be great if you could perhaps wait outside the, the nightclub and... And, it, and capture this this superstar. Yeah, it's not even just your photos. It's like, I guess the dream video for us is him arriving at the club to flashing lights. Like, like, as if he's Tom Cruise. And him to almost want to get through that as quickly as possible, you know, <laughs> as if it's a hindrance to his night. <laughs> oh, this is... I mean, this is great. Yeah, if you're a local talkie really pap, um, reach out to the podcast, please, and we'd love to work with you. <laughs> Peter.crouch at <laughs> So good. Um, should we do one more message? I got one that kind of sings to me as a fellow laptop user. I've got a message from Phil. I was listening to the latest podcast episode and it reminded me when you used to mention a few years back that managers playing championship manager in their spare time. You guys have interviewed a bunch of managers on the pod, but you've never actually asked them the question. I'd love to know if Sean Dyche is getting home to his missus and banging out a few hours of champ man. Imagine if Mourinho had spent all day grafting at work and then coming home and went on championship manager. You see some great managers managing you on that game as well, don't you? I mean, you yeah. see some people do some wonderful things. Yeah, well, I get, I get like sent all the time, like, um, you know, contract negotiations and like I'm asking for too much, so I leave. And, and people are going to me, oh, fucking greedy bastard. I'm going, oh. It's like the, it's the year, you know, 24, 34. And I'm like, it's not real, you know what I mean? really say that. Well, Crouchy shouldn't be asking for 300 grand well, a week. No, You're an no, agent, no, sends no, a forward. No, I'm a great manager. I'm a really good manager. <laughs> but it's like, I used to play it back in the day and remember it was the old space bar to skip and the two fellas who created it, I remember they put themselves in the game and they were the two, two of the best players. I remember Neil Lamptey, you had, uh, God, there was little there was little cheats, wasn't there? Like Oliver Bierhoff was, was my man, um, who I'll always remember. Great game, mm. great game. Yeah. Um, but man, if managers do it, I mean, Imagine going all day at work, right, managing it, and then coming home and doing it for like. Yeah, but isn't that isn't fun. that the same as like a train simulator? You know, except you've been driving a train all day, and then you go back and do that. Yeah, but would you do or it? A pilot with planes. Well, that's well, that's the question. I because guess, I used to it? do like football. Like I would, I'd play football, and then I'd, I I might play in the evening with my mates when I was younger, or play FIFA. Yeah. One of the things that managers can use it for is almost like testing things out, like testing tactics out in the sense of doing something really weird and seeing if it works. Because mm. the simulator is that good that it will do similar things to what actually happens. Yeah. It's a great resource for them. All right. Should we get into the pod? Okay, so this episode's about red cards. Bit of a touchy point for you, Crouchy. We've discussed this a few mm. times. You know, you've had some personal experiences on this that haven't been great. No, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's great ever when you get sent off. But um, yeah, I, it's, it's something that I like, because I had to change my personality when I played football. Like I was probably too nice when I was a kid and I was always told that I was too nice. 
And it was constantly like, it was like holding me back. So I had to sort of become someone else on the pitch to, as I was off it. Um, and yeah, there was an element of nastiness that I think you have to have uh, to succeed. And I think more so maybe when I was coming through than maybe now, because you, you can't get as away with, with as much. But yeah, I had to have a, a, you know, have a harder side to myself. That, and I found myself spilling over and getting uh, probably, you know, over, stepping over the line a few times. And I, I got sent off like four or five times in my career. Yeah, so not great. How did it feel when the referees pulled out that red card? There's nothing worse because it's like, it's such a sinking feeling that you just want to grab it and like put it back in. <laughs> well, J- John Terry did that, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you're like, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, no one saw it. Because you know that there's no going back from well, it's that. a different movement as well, isn't it? Yeah, you, know, well, you know, it's off from the left hand, isn't it? You the know. Back pocket. It's back pocket yeah. instead of top pocket. And um, yeah, he's writing stuff down and then you go to the back and you're like, please, no. Because <laughs> uh, you just know you fucked up and you know you've let the, everyone in the stadium down. You've let all the players down. You've let the manager down. You let your family down. Let yourself down. So so in that instant moment, um, do, were you the kind of player, because remind me how it worked with you, would you get straight off the pitch? I always think with that um, Argentina red with uh, Beckham and... No, no, Beckham no. and... Um, oh, Simeone. Simeone. Simeone, wasn't it? Um, so when he d- did that and he got the red, there's always that moment you see his eyes closed and he turns around and then walks, walks away. Off, yeah. And the camera follows him on that. Occasionally you get a player that likes to argue it. And yeah, know, well, I think they're they're there are times to them. argue. Like, I remember my first ever setting off, I think it was away at Crewe and I was, at, I, was at, I was playing for QPR... And um, I can't remember what the first booking was, but the second booking was someone tried to... I think I gave away a free kick. I was a little bit annoyed that I gave away a free kick because uh, I didn't think it was one. So I was already on a, on a booking. He puts the ball down and he goes to play a quick one. And as he goes to play a quick one, I've just done a little shithouse move, like a little <laughs> like a little t- tiny shithouse move, like just blocking it a little bit with my foot. And it's hit... The ball's hit, hit my foot. And then I've gone like, uh, like straight away, like trying to, oh, oh, sorry, like you took it too quick. And then um, I've just been done for like, you know, being three yards away from the ball when he took a 10 free kick and then I, and then I was sent off. Do you play different when you've been booked? That's a, that's a question I think a lot of fans would ask players. Like when you've been seeing that first yellow card, does your game change? We well, have to be sent more sensible, definitely. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, there are times like I've been, you know, when I look at players now, like there definitely is more, more straight now. When I look at some of the players and think, you know, how what wound up I used to get, and I think, I don't know how you're, you know, when someone's cheating and... You I know, think there's too much restraint. I think even so much defensively, restraint. players having to run around with hands behind their backs. There's loads uh, of it, isn't there? And, yeah. and, and, like, the way that you've got to position yourself, maybe VAR has also caused it, because that's a weak... What you're talking about there, getting a second yellow for something like that, it's not a red card, it's mm. not... It's the only flaw, I think, with two yellows is mm. it changes the game so massively that mm. to get done on a slight shit house thing like that or a shirt off. Oh, it's just getting the, the, the worst it's, thing. It's not like right. Like, I don't know, a bit of maybe a bit of descent or not, not coming back from the free kick, little things like that. They're not, it doesn't feel like, they, but they are in the rules of the game. So, yeah, just shocking. But I, I mean, I used to quite like, you know, when you could see a player getting wound up, like, you know, someone had done a bad tackle on someone and you could see them getting up and seeing a bit of verbal and you could see they've lost it a bit. And I used to be so excited for that next tackle <laughs> because you just knew they'd lost it. Like Wayne Rooney, for instance, you knew that someone had come through the back of him, he was arguing with the ref and then the ball drops for 50-50 and you go, oh my God, this is like pay-per-view because you just know he's going to just <laughs> do something reckless, right? But I don't know, it's saying it's something quite exciting for fans with that, like with Roy Keane, you could see him get wound up and you know, he's, and then he's running 100 miles an hour and you know he's wound up and you think, this is going to be tasty. The proper tackle. But but to Dave's point, when you're playing on a yellow card and and maybe, it, I mean, it is in your mind. You, you surely are playing differently. Have you ever had a manager that has instructed the team to play differently to protect the oh, player yeah, that's on the yellow? Yeah, like, definitely. Yeah, like, and, and does that word come from the bench or is that just a natural thing within the team? Yeah, no, no, no lots of times I've seen managers do it. Uh, players tell players, you know, a lot of the time it'd be a fullback or a centre-half. Um, and, and often the other side, so the, the, the offensive team will be like, you know, say we've got um, Wilfred Zaha or Gareth Bale. I was playing at Tottenham, right? Gareth Bale, the right-back's on a, on a yellow card. Keep giving it to Gareth. Get at him, get at him, because he can't dive in. 
And, and all it takes is Gareth to just nick the ball past him. Uh, so we, you, you'd utilise it, you know, because he's on a yellow, he can't, he can't dive in. And he might, you know, get beat and pull a, you know, a little, and then you've, it's game over. Because that's, that's how big it is. You, you're down to 10 minutes, quite often game over. What about when it's your teammate? So there, there's a game looking back at, kind of, you're playing at Liverpool. There's a game where Gerrard got sent off for a second yellow. It was in real quick succession. I think it was within two minutes. What do you say to someone like Gerard that is the leader, is the captain, he's just been booked, he's obviously lost his head. Mm. How do you calm him down? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a that's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, you know, like, because, like, Steve used to get really wound up, like, in his early days, like, for those Everton games, for those United games, I mean, some of the tackles, some of the sendings off, you know, they were obviously, like, I'm sure he'll look back on them, and but he was so wound up in those games and getting a lot of grief from the stands, and you can see why it spills over, but you just can't allow yourself. And I think players are definitely better at conducting themselves now. I see players now like Grealish, for instance, certainly in the, you know, I keep going back to the, like the Carver Howell against, against Real Madrid. And uh, he was obviously trying to wind him up, but he just, he wasn't allowing him to, to get in his head. And I've got so much admiration for players who can, because a lot of the time, there were times where I, I didn't have that restraint. I think Grealish is amazing. Just on that, on, on that reference there, like Grealish, it is famously good at drawing in a foul, um, but also representing it well enough that he, I call him representing it. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, he goes down at the right time. He's able to get back up again, ultimately, which is important, especially when you're supporting England, you know. Don't want him to get injured. But he does seem to be able to put himself in positions where so many players still nibble at him. Yeah, but I think it's just like the way he carries the ball, isn't it? And, uh, you know, quite often he carries the ball like across players and you know, um, invites tackles. I mean, Paul Gascoigne was was similar to it. You know, it's like you hold on to the ball maybe a bit too long, but like enough to, you know, because he's good at it uh, and players want to nibble at him and quite often he, he draws the fouls. Who's the biggest shithouse you've played against when a player on your team is booked to get them sent off? Usually the captains and you know, quite often I remember, uh, you know, like Jamie Carragher or John Terry, players like that would... It would always be Darren Fletcher. These were players that always talk to the ref like constantly. They like, boss the game. Um, Roy Keane, look quite often those those big kind of captains like Vieiras. They were always around the ref, always in the ref's ear. And because they're close in the middle of the pitch, they were they were constantly talking to the ref. John, John Terry was the best at it. He was. I've never, you know, he he he, he bossed games. From, when you say the best of it, what do you mean? Shit out of it. Because I also would think that's a bit of the game that, especially you being a bit more old school, that you wouldn't necessarily... Oh, I guess it's always been part of the game. So maybe maybe you do respect it as a, te a sort of technique or tactic of the game. Do you know what? It's, it's not I, football. I, 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 no, it's, I do respect chat. it. No, I respect it massively. I think it's it's any little edge you can get. You know, it's constantly... If, if, if you're referring a game, right, you might not even know. You know, you're facing the other way, right, looking at the play... And I'm just, I'm just, you know, little things like Darren Fletcher was really good at it as well. He's just constantly whispering like, oh, he's got away with two there. You know? <laughs> and it's just, but you know, they're like all game, right? It's Darren Brown. Oh, he's got, yeah, he's literally he's like, he's in his head, but he doesn't even know. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he's going like, like yeah, he yeah, he's got, well, he has got away with two. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and like, because it's such a split second thing. It's like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you know, <laughs> come here. It's a booking. You know, little things like if you're constantly in someone's ear, you you try and block it out for as much as you can, but. It's, it's, it's impossible. And I think it's, it's just those kind of tiny little edges. I think one of the interesting questions, Crouchy, when you've had a teammate sent off, how does the team adapt to that? Yeah, quite often uh, you just retreat. You know, I, I, you always take, quite often I've been there where you've taken a striker off. It's not often me. If we're playing with two up front, you know, I'd usually stay on, um, <laughs> unfortunately. And then... <laughs> You know, because he, I, I was quite good at holding the ball up. So, you, you know, if, if, if the, if the defence could manage to clear it, I was all right at keeping the ball and we could, we could you know, bring the team higher up the pitch and have some kind of influence on their goal. Um, whereas, say, um, Jermaine Defoe would, would be more of a goal scorer around the box kind of play. If we were playing higher up, any chance would fall to him. That, you know, maybe not quite as good at holding it up as, as me. So um, maybe he could be replaced with bringing another defender on. But then most of the time you just retreat. It's everyone behind the ball. You know, you get nine players and, and the goalkeeper be on the ball. And it's, I've got a bit of an issue with this because what I disagree with is, say, if a goalie gets sent off, that an outfield player then has to come off 
and you bring on another goalie, so you're still down to 10 men. No, hit me out. Hit me out. What the fuck are you talking about? We, think about it. If you're a goalie that's been sent off, right, you shouldn't be able to have a goalie. Yeah. But what invariably happens is a player that's done nothing wrong has to come Guess off hauled, yeah. to bring a goalie on so you've got a goalie in there and not a defender. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I don't think that should be allowed. I think that's a loophole in this system that needs to be closed. If your keeper up. gets sent off, you have to bring on a player. Well, I'm saying if you're going to do that then, player then player. let's say you get a red card in a game, but you're having a fucking blinder, you should speak to the manager and go, look, I'm having a great one. Someone else gets to take the red card for you. Right? It's all interesting stuff. But, but what I'm saying is that's what happens with goalkeepers at the moment. What annoys me is it feels like if a goalkeeper has got a red card, I don't think you should be allowed to bring another goalkeeper mm. on. Yeah. Because what it's you're doing is is passing the red card to someone else almost. I think we need to ask Aaron about this. I think we have need to ask him what he would do in that environment. Mm. Crouch, have you ever been asked to go and go if one of your if one of your keepers has been sent off? I don't oh, think I have. No, I don't think I have. It is, it's all, it's great. There's been some great ones over the years. You've seen Vinnie Jones when he when he goes in goal. He's, he's good. He's you got Rio Ferdinand, Harry John, John O'Shea, like Harry Kane. <laughs> John O'Shea is a classic, actually. Yeah. I think he ended up a couple of times, uh, didn't he? Been a few yeah. over the years. Do you practice that? No. <laughs> no. Oh, so it's all. literally just oh. in game of fine margins, as you put it, yeah. every little detail. Yeah. There but, isn't there is until a player gets sent off, there isn't a discussion mm. about who goes and goes. Yeah. But do you know what 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 time to be alive that was? You know, like <laughs> nowadays you've got three keepers on the you know, you've got yeah. Scott Carson, Rob Green, and um, you know, Stuart Scott Taylor. Carson. <laughs> Can we have an honourable shout out to Scott Carson? Oh, Scott Carson. Well, he's we just signed a new contract, the, didn't he? We were going to get one. Well, of course yeah, he has. Yeah, he's he's, he's got, never leaving. He's got to come on. The, he's got to come on the pod. We, well, I think he was coming on at one point, and then yeah. he end, He was going away. Might even been the end of last season. It was like the gap, and annoyingly, because this is how organised we are. We've waited another season, and we're in exactly the same position. Wayne Lineker's probably got him now. Although I think he's slightly classier than that, isn't he? I think he's. Uh, well, you're trying to say that it's not classy to go to Ocean Beach. No, Peach. you're right. Yeah. That's wrong for me to say. That was wrong, wasn't it? I take that back. <laughs> Big shout out, Wayne. No, he's busy. Uh, busy, busy, over there, busy at the moment. Can't get older than minute. Saw Harvey Elliott there a couple of weeks ago, and that was just one that popped up. So I assume there's been loads. Yeah, oh, man. He'll have them all in at the minute. Crouch, you're running the numbers. The Christmas period seems a little bit suspicious. <laughs> Kevin Nolan suspended in December, five seasons in a row. Do players get sent off to have some extra Christmas dinner? Five seasons in a row. But like the thing is, is like there's so many games. You think about it. We played the, the 26th. We played the 28th. You know, the first. Uh, you play this around Christmas. There's so many games, and if you get suspended for that little 26th one, you know, you are going to have Christmas with the family, and then you'll come back the 28th. It's not as if like you know. It's just a it's just a one game. It definitely back. happens, Dave. It it, it definitely it, happens. That's what Peter. I was suspended right once <laughs> for one Christmas, and um, I always remember it. And uh, Ab was like, "Can't you do this every year?" <laughs> <laughs> like, because right, I'm but not, be I'm, honest, what did you say back to Abby? I said no because I'm so I'm a professional. Exactly like that. No. But <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> but no, like, when, once you're in the game, you're in the game. Like, I don't, I know there's a lot of shit houses where, you know, Jose Mourinho, for instance, with Javi Alonso, you know, people telling him to, to get booked or, or, you know, so he, he'd miss one game and then be back for the, for the game that mattered. There's a lot of shit houses involved, involved. And I'm, I'm sure back in the day that was the case. I wanted, to, I genuinely wanted to play every game and I, I actually enjoyed the Christmas period. Getting out of the house is actually <laughs> lovely. Like, you, you, you know... You, Trip you, away from San Marino. You, know, you chain, chain on Christmas Day. And like, yeah, I want to I wake up. Like, I didn't have my kids when I was playing. My, my, I had my first baby at 30. Uh, so she was... Yeah, by the time I... You know, I'd missed a couple of Christmases with, with her, um, you know, present-wise and things like that. But you, you can still do the presents in the morning. And then you go... Uh, to training and you might stay in a hotel Christmas night and play on Boxing Day but I quite, that I makes quite me sad it. the Christmas night hotel does make me sad it's quite, it's yeah, quite a sad that, state of affairs because the, the worst one's actually New Year's Eve because everyone's out having a party or with their loved ones or whatever and yeah but this Christmas dinner one it, uh, what I'm imagining is the music is like and may all your Christmas 
<laughs> <laughs> the cracker like that, you know <laughs> and while I'm eating like a spaghetti bolognese and a, and a boiled chicken it's, I'm, I'm imagining ready meal <laughs> it's a chicken sad, dinner for one or is it like a few of the players get together and you have quite a nice Christmas not saying you're boozy nah, but I'm saying nah, it's, it's quite it's quite Sad state of affairs, really. Well, because in the hotel on Christmas Day, if you're in a hotel Christmas Day, like you'll do, you'll spend it at home and then you'll train and then you'll go on the coach and you'll forget it's even Christmas Day, to be quite honest, um, because you're just in the zone for the game the next day. And then you'll go to the hotel and then everyone's with their families in a, in a hotel. So people who've gone to a hotel to stay with their families and then us. Bob Geldof should have done you a song, shouldn't yeah, he? Yeah. Imagine that. Do they know it's Christmas time at all? <laughs> Peter <laughs> Crouch. <laughs> it's Does the real... he know it's Christmas time? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's just it's it's probably a hard time. Um, you know, just because you're a wag, but like you're doing something you love. It's not like you're going down the mines on Christmas Day, is it? You know what I mean? We're going to play football in a in a stadium, and you know, I've I always felt. It was a it was a good time, and I was I always oh, understood. You're paid. Lots of people work on Christmas Day, and we should say that as well. We're only having a laugh. Like, there's a lot of people who are working Christmas. My, you know, as I've said on this podcast, my brother's a paramedic, and there are you know I'm extremely proud of him going and doing that time. I'm sure your family are very yeah. proud of you going and do because it's not it's not the easiest thing at, at Christmas, but you're very lucky to be able to do yeah, so. Yeah, but as well. also it's a great thing for fans to go on Boxing Day, right? Yeah. So you've had your Christmas Day with your family, and then you can go out and go and watch a match. Great, isn't it? I've had some big ones, big boxing days where by maybe like 11.30, probably done about four to five Jaeger bombs, a few Sambucas, and you can't even see straight. Mm. And then you go to the football and it's amazing. It's, it's a quiet boxing, game, boxing day. day. Is, it, that is such a different, that is such a unique experience every year. And the one thing that's changed for me, I do think I need to cut down on the booze a little bit. That's a discussion for another day. But, um, but the Christmas day... You know, you're up till quite late. I end up watching the basketball early hours on Christmas Day with Dude. my brother-in-law. Yeah, up at four in the morning. That's what's Dude, on. Four in the morning, Christmas Day. Right. Bro Brooklyn, Do you like a big Christmas Bro Eve? Brooklyn, no, I don't, I don't like that. Oh, don't like that. Well, I get too excited. No, Christmas Eve, because it ruins the Christmas Day. It does, dinner. yeah, but I do it every year. I just ruin I Christmas Day every year. So <laughs> I kind of, I, I'm disciplined enough... <laughs> To, oh, yeah. uh, to kind of not go too heavy on Christmas Eve. Enjoy Christmas Day. Four in the morning, I'm watching Brooklyn Nets and uh, I've got like a Brooklyn Nets shirt, which I only comes out at Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and then... <laughs> I have to say, right, for me, that is the weirdest Christmas I think I've ever heard. No. So you don't go, like, Christmas Eve is such a good night. Christmas Eve's so disciplined, so I'll but have, whoa, I'll have, I'll have And then the next shirt goes on and you do four in the morning. And then, Who are you parching on Christmas Eve? Uh, no, Christmas Eve will be very pleasant. Um, th to the pub most, or three, home? Three pub and then back home. But at the pub, I'm very much like, because I've, I've experienced what it's like to be so rotten on Christmas Day and not being able to eat the dinner, my mum being unhappy and stuff like that. It's really ingrained in me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now I'm True. in charge of the Christmas dinner, obviously. You know, I fire up the barbecues mm. and do it all out there. Oh. Uh, turkey involved. Uh, won't get into that. Uh, honestly, uh, I never, I'll never come to yours on Christmas Day. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking <Sorry>. basketball and barbecue. <laughs> what a load of shite. No, it's not. It's a, bet, it's a bet, better dinner than what you make, mate. <laughs> Anyway, we won't start this argument again. No, let's keep it nice on this one. We were, we've had a chat. And and um, anyway, so four in the morning, around then, the basketball will be fired up because uh, that will be happening in America. Whack on a Brooklyn Nets. Um, in fact, last Christmas, I, had a, I, ordered, I ordered in a Brooklyn Nets um, Christmas jumper for me and my brother-in-law. So we sit there and finish off whatever booze and... <laughs> That's fucking blowing my mind. You're blowing my mind at the minute. The problem is, <laughs> right? The, it's fucking loads of problems. The problem is the Boxing Day fixtures, which on paper you get really excited for because you think, great, it's like still Christmas time down at Vicarage Road. But I'm in the worst state possible, especially you get the oh, early kickoff. Day. Yeah, you yeah, know so when the fixtures you come again, out. Isn't it? The when the hangover. fixtures come out, what's the first fixtures you look for? It's first day of the season. Boxing Day, New Year's Day. Yeah, that's true. Most three as most footballers important as well, games. You know, as, as footballers, it's the exact same. It's like who've we got first because it's exciting. 
then it was like, who we got boxing pay? Because you want to organise if you can you get know, a red card. Because, you know, I might have Liverpool away and we'll, all, we'll just do it all up there. Do you know what I mean? Like, Ab's family's yeah. up there. So, you know, I'll do, I'll, we'll do Christmas up there and then I can go to the game and come back. And, you know, I'm involved. I love it's the same for But it's like, you know, we look at that and I was like, right, New Year's Day, where are we? You know, we might not have a game. We're like, whoa, I'm in the house. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's what an amazing shared experience between fans and players yeah, that yeah, probably all, players happens. don't even think about the that, same yeah, it's, no, those, it all, it's those all three happens. fixtures that see the only thing I don't think about in that period Trinity. is who the Brooklyn fucking Nets are playing <laughs> 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 All right, so, so Mark Noble had talked about this on the podcast, Dave, um, about these uh, Kevin Nolan red cards. Ooh. Have you got any other examples of uh, Christmas suspensions? Yeah, the other one I'm thinking of, Crouchy, have you had any uh, teammates that have done a Neil Ruddock? In the 14 years he played in the top flight, he was suspended six times over Christmas. Oh Who was the Neil Ruddock of the squad? Well, no, Kev Nolan, yeah. I mean, I mean that one was the one, like, modern, modern, modern day. Like, between 2008 and 2013... Um, He's suspended over Christmas for five seasons in a row. I mean, that is that is a big one, that. Um, Ruddock, in 14 years, that's over six years. And you think of Ruddock, I imagine he likes Christmas. You know, he likes eating and he likes drinking. So I imagine Christmas is a busy period for him. What do you say as a teammate, if you're playing for West Ham United when he's there getting suspended, what are you saying? There was a certain instance over Aintree, um, I remember at Liverpool, where, uh, where Rob, Robbie Fowler and Didier Mann um, we're both we're both ill over the uh, <laughs> the Grand National period. Uh, <laughs> I did wonder. I did, you know, I did have a few concerns with that. But, <laughs> but they weren't playing. They, they, you know, they weren't they weren't playing much then, and you know, it was you know a bad illness going around at mm. that time. You're concerned but, uh, about whether they had enough pints, whether they'd won any money on the races. They both enjoyed the day in the races, have <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, they both well, did. What can you do if you're suspended? You know, yeah. you're either well, yeah. no, you're, you're ill or you're like, suspended. It's, it's not a lot you can do about no, it, is it? Just it's to... basically a work sickie, but, you know, it's football <laughs> instead of work. It's true. Like, yeah, when you think <laughs> when you about, think about how many people pull out a sickie, at, well, yeah. you know, at work, and you know everyone knows, but you can't go... You weren't fucking ill. <laughs> you know, you can't say, well, When's you, it, okay, you wait, didn't mean to two-foot that fella. Here's a question for you both. <laughs> When's the last time you've had to deploy the uh, ill voice? Oh, no, you see, this isn't, like, in my makeup to, to, to do it all. So, let's I've say... I've never done it. Okay, have you never had to never ring a manager it. doing that? Uh, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry. No, I've never. <laughs> I prided myself on the fact that I just didn't get... Like, I, I, I never miss a day's training for, for being ill. There was, I got meningitis once where I was in hospital uh, at Stoke. I mean, that was a real bad one. I, um, I was in a bad way. Uh, and there was another one at Stoke as well. But, like, maybe two days over the course of a 15-year career, I, 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 like, genuinely, like, completely fucked. I, I've, I've never, ever been, like, sort of hungover or been like, oh, I don't fancy it today. Or, I, I've never done that. No, because footballers want to play football, don't they, Dave? And I think I think that's what's mad about that situation as well is footballers are often so keen to dive, right, and make a meal and you can <laughs> see the acting on it that I'm so intrigued to know what it would sound like if a footballer tried to take a day off work with a nil voice. Can you imagine... When you see how dramatic the dives are, <laughs> what that must sound like as a call. Well, like what Luis Suarez or something like that just calling in, like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm so ill. <laughs> so ill. <laughs> it's just like, you know, when most people go, I'm sorry, I can't come in today. I've got a bit of a headache. Come on, Gaffa, Gaffa, so ill. Oh, it's coming out of me like floods. <laughs> Both ends, Gaffer! Both ends! Help me, Gaffer! It flow like river! It flow like river. Wow. Yeah, the worst thing is nowadays what they do, the doctor goes to the house. So whatever, oh. if if you're not if you're not um well, they always well, I'll send a doc round, so the doctor comes around the house, so you better be good at acting. Oh, so it's a club doctor. Club doctor will come. And they out. report back to the manager. Yeah, to go so, yeah, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> so you know, bad. if you're sitting there with, you know, a load of open <laughs> bottles of champagne and <laughs> still got a lardy on in the back, like, oh, <laughs> like you're going to get found out. <laughs> 
Crouch, I'd like to actually bring up the uh, 21st of December 2011. Um, the only game that you appear to have missed with flu. Really? Yeah. Was that meningitis? Was that... What game was that? Sorry? C can't find the game, but it was in between the, the 21st date? and the 23rd of December. What year? Tell me. 2011. I missed the game. Missed the game. That's right. I'm just I'd seeing if there's any pictures of you in nightclubs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was a game against Manchester City, a 3 0 defeat. That wasn't a pre Christmas. No, you know uh, what? I remember party? that. I remember that well because I remember there was a particular time. It was a, um, Christmas Eve. I remember trying to go out because I was in bed, in bed, in bed. And then after it was Christmas Eve, come out for dinner with us. I went out for dinner and then came home within half an hour and went back to bed. Remember it. It's fair enough. No dodging Christmas then. No, no suspensions. Dodging. No dodging. No suspensions. No, no dodgy thrown in illness. You won't catch me out, honestly, because. I genuinely didn't do it. I couldn't see anything. I just had a quick Google. Yeah. Did you ever look at nightclubs yeah. at that time? I typed in Peter Crouch nightclub and that date. And but do you look at Stoke? George has found one. Have you found one, George? Peter Cr Headline, Peter Crouch does robot dance at Stoke Christmas party. 8th of December, 2011. Well done, George. 8th of December? 2011. Oh, yeah, but that might be the weirdest whoa, week. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, that might be where I caught it. Here's the <laughs> We've got to do an investigation here. There's a do you know what's amazing? The what photo can't the even get your head oh. in. Some pap has managed to get it. <laughs> the headless crouch. This is amazing. Bastard, the robot, George. it says, the robot is... Well done, mate. No. Well done. <laughs> well done. We've got him. The robot is back. Peter Crouch was the life and soul of the Stoke Christmas party, crouching to do a line dance with teammates. <laughs> 2011. This is good. As soon as the DJ spun Candy by Cameo, <laughs> Crouch 30 dragged Jermaine Pennant <laughs> Did I? on the dance floor to do the electric slide line dance with a few token robot moves. They had pals including Chelsea rivals Ashley Cole and John Terry watching on from their VIP corner <laughs> in hysterics. One reveler. Oh, this is reveler. so new. One reveler. Always a reveler. <laughs> Always a reveler. In, uh, in one reveler at Funky Buddha <laughs> in Mayfair on the Tuesday Tuesday night. Said it was off hilarious. on a Wednesday. We're off on a Wednesday. Crouch got a circle around him as he did his body popping and locking. At one point, he and the lads took it in turns to hijack the microphone and serenade the crowd. <laughs> this is a real story. Are you making it's this a up? Real story, really? mate. Amazing. Classic you, that. Funky Buddha as well. I've not heard that mentioned for a while. Yeah, I mean, those were the days. Good old days. Well done, George. That was all good fun, you know. But, like, maybe, you know, I, I, would, I would, did, was genuinely ill. But that a might, week might, after. It might have been from that night, you know. Mm. There was a lot of, there was a lot of um, you know, stuff floating about in there. To, to be fair, the... <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of germs. The, um, the 8th to the 23rd is, I think... A justifiable gap. Yeah, but Crouch, you missed the game against Manchester City. Uh, Stoke lost 3 0. Aguero scored twice. The referee that day, Mike Dean. Was it really? Uh, we're really digging down. This is this yeah. is amazing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. I feel like I'm getting exposed here, but I got nothing to hide. I um you know, I, I, I was professional all the way. And yeah, I was probably in Funky Buddha on that Tuesday. But <laughs> You know, but I was enjoying myself. Should we quickly go through your red cards? Oh, let's, you know, let's, let's go let's through them, shall we? Take we've, it away. We've got to get the laptop out. Um, <clears throat> it's It's been, you know, we've done a lot of research, obviously, with a little bit of an off-season for myself. Spent a lot of time inside with my laptop. So, what do you want from me, Dave? What do you want me to say? Do you want uh, a little bit of analysis. What go, what do you goes, want me to say if they're reds or not? Yeah, we, we'll, we'll look at it, we'll analyse it, and then if you so think you that think. you should or shouldn't have been sent okay. off from these moments. I think what Pete's saying is, is he, right now, should he be trying to defend this red card? Or does he, with the hindsight of um, age, want to look at this? I think we just evaluate them. I've got no recollection of this one at all. Was this Crouch on Stephen Davis of Southampton? Crouch versus Stephen Davis. Could have been a boxing match. Well, it I was played, taken... I played, with him. I played with him at Villa, like, really nice guy. <laughs> so what happened was here, Crouchy? Oh my god, it's so awful. Do you know you've turned into that as well? You've oh, you've, I know what's happened. You've fucked up. That's yeah. Why you're angry. I know what's happened, yeah. So let's talk us through just around the centre circle. I've tried to lay it off. Balls come into your feet, it's come off it your off feet. I've gone I've gone to like like play out wide and it's hit my own shin and, and bounced away. It's from a bad me. touch. Terrible touch. So, so at what? that point you're trying to recover the situation. 
I also know this period of my career as well. I'll touch on it after the tackle. Yeah, I've done it. Awful, awful. But you've lifted your leg up yeah, and everything. Tackle. That angle's horrendous because you 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 are looking at him coming in. Like it feels like an out of body experience. Yeah. Like looking at that doesn't feel like that. That would be me. Um, I had a bad touch, and I know that. So I I would have only just come off the bench now, and we're losing. And I was fuming that I felt that I should be starting at this particular time, um, and I wasn't. So every time I came on the pitch, I was angry. I had something to prove. I was like, I was an older player and I was just frustrated at my lack of game time. So whenever I came, I did tackles. I remember doing one against Cesar Fabregas. Probably worst tackle. I had to ring him up <laughs> Saturday night and apologise and just say, I don't know what I was doing. I'm so sorry. Uh, and again, this one, That's like, this strange. is, did, this did is you, something that... Did you have to do that often? Ring no, no, but like at this period of my career... I can um, see the frustration. It's though. almost like you're coming to the end of like it's like retirement, if you know what but I mean. But is that because that touch, that first touch you make on this, you would never have made that touch. No, I mean that was a terrible touch, and I'm like, I, I don't even know. I mean, the touch is like a different person. Like, so you're not looking then, at the player in terms of you. You know, love Stephen Davis. He's whoever, one of the nicest guys in football. It's whoever was about at that moment. Yeah, you, you're blaming your fuck up. It's entirely, entirely my fault. The mm. touch was awful. I was an angry man at this time and the tackle was terrible. Straight red, get him off. Straight red, get him off. So let's move on to another one. Uh, the next one we're going to take a look at is against Chelsea, we John do... Obi mikel oh, this, this, is so this is a banger. This is a, a, hell, of, a hell of a challenge. We should Liverpool. do this with Emily Maitlis, it feels. Oh. It feels more like what we should do is dim the lights. Emily Maitlis in front of you going, now, Peter, what, you know, what Talk was this? Talk this. us through. In the roll neck of shame or something. Awful tackle. <laughs> I love the fact that you, you you really come off your feet. You've you've taken like both feet off the ground. It's in almost like a, I don't know, karate kid type position. And then you go... But the ball's by the line as well. Straight through the back of it. I've absolutely no... Exp like, I missed him as well. Totally missed him. But what's happened was... so. I remember it was Cavalio who was behind me and um, Obi Mikel was like screening in front of me and it was annoying me because he was doing such a good job and most of the time I, what I used to like to do is like centre-halves used to dink the ball into me like over the, over the press and I'd just I'd chest it down and, and we'd play from there and I'd usually have a field day uh, but he was in front of me and he was strong, he was awkward and I wasn't getting it and I, I, I wasn't in the game because of it and it was frustrating and then he was standing on my toes and the referee wasn't giving me anything and it was towards the end of the game we were losing and then the frustration just pulled over and I just I just thought I'm not having this anymore the ball bounced perfectly and I thought he's getting it and uh, I went for it awful tackle how did Mourinho react to that? to be fair to him he when I went off he just knew that I like and I, he sort of knew me as the person I was he knew that wasn't me yeah. and he was just like you know like you know yeah. fucked up <laughs> he didn't. He didn't need to do the whole screaming down. No, the line, because it was. It? I was already was, gone. Yeah. Uh, it was a terrible tackle. Uh, and the worst thing is, after that, because I had such a red mist, I forgot really what I'd actually done. And you know, it was like a, it's like an out of body kind of experience. So then I went after, and then the press asked me about the tackle, and I was like, uh, I think I even said something like, "Yeah, um, you know, there's a problem with diving and this, you know, like, the culture of football at the moment needs changing, addressing." <laughs> What's oh, incredible? He what's he, he's not. He's still on his feet. Never, he's like, still on his feet yeah. after the tackle. I just want to see this reaction <laughs> afterwards like, as well, because there's a bit of pushing. Like you get the red. It's to be fair, it is like that Beckham one where you turn away with the red. Just, yeah. But um, who's pushing you there? Ah, is that Carvalho? It is Carvalho, isn't it? Oh, crowd, she's bad. So after after you've done that, red. when you're Awful. going into the dressing room, are you punching a wall? Are you? throwing your shirt oh, off. so what? angry, yeah, so angry. I think that's the interesting side that like a, a player that you're not a direct opponent of, let's say if it was a centre-half winding you up, a centre-half standard on you, but it was a defensive midfielder, which kind of brings in that interesting side to the game that they're so important in screening. Yeah, they are, they're really important. Like, so it's like, like you say, like a defensive midfield player, but like, time, like nowadays we probably don't have as many sort of target men, but like I was like, like you know, literally a target. You could hit me from anywhere and I'd, I'd pride myself on the fact that you'd be able to keep the ball um, and just bring others into play higher up the pitch. But when you had two on you, basically, the teams knew what you were going to do. Mikel would be in front of me, you know, I'd quite, I had a few good, good sort of screens. Michael Carrick used to do it at United. Um, lots of players used to stand in front of you and you just couldn't receive the ball on your chest. Did, um, did Terry 
message you after this. Or, well, there's been times like, I, like for instance, like Obi Mikel, like I would have said to, to one of them, like, like you say, Lamps or John Terry, and just said to him, like, can you apologise to Obi Mikel for me? Um, and if it was as bad as the one I did with says Fabregas, I got his number off, um, I think Asmir Begovic was at uh, Chelsea at the time, and I just got his number off him uh, and called him, just like, you know, that was, I just don't know what I was doing, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and he was cool with it? He, he was totally fine, yeah, yeah. He said I was a bit shocked. He said I turned around and I was expecting, like, you know, Shawcross or someone. <laughs> <laughs> you've, been uh, in, you've been influenced. Uh, yeah, well, like Robert Hoof or someone, <laughs> you know what I mean? And he was like, oh, no, he was just, I said I was just a bit shocked when I saw it was you. And I was like, yeah, sorry. Which is exactly why you called, actually, because it was. A yeah, bit because out of it was. It was out. Have, you, have you ever had it the other way around where players have called you to kind of issue the apology to someone? Yeah, else? yeah, I've had a few apologies. Yeah. yeah, over the years. I didn't know that happens. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, quite a few. But I think what's incredible is you, what you played for over five hundred games. You only got four red cards in the Premier League, mm. or four red cards when you're in that. That changed that's about your game then, right? Or is that something that is that maturity or is that being savvy uh, to situations? Well, I, don't know, I don't know because um, no, I, th I think I always had it. Uh, uh, I had it around me, like because I got sent off when I was thirty for um, Tottenham in the Bernabeu as well. But there's not m that many red cards, is it, for a career? Or is no, it? it's, it's yeah. a yeah. it's a tiny no, no. amount. So for a striker, so the, the four red cards, uh, you great. know, after getting out of Division One with QPR. One of them being in the Champions League, three of them coming in the Premier. That's that is a tiny amount. That shows great restraint. Okay. I personally think I would have got sent off a lot more for those types of things. If there's a defensive midfielder stepping on your toe, they would have lost it. Do you think because yeah, you were quite liked in football, did you get away with some? No, no, no. I think I was constantly, uh, I was constantly pulled up for things quite a lot. Like there's the way I was. Like I was like I was like I was more obvious when I was giving fouls away and stuff. Like, if I did anything, like, a lot of the time, if you're kind of smaller, you'd get away with things more. Yeah, but don't you think the same could be said for the fact that because you were physically, uh, like, taller, stronger than some of the players there, that actually there was an expectation that you shouldn't be pulled up on things because that was just the nature. Mm. Ha We've said this with Haaland. Like, maybe he gets away with a bit more of bit, uh, physical kind of way. And if you see a player fall into yeah, the yeah, side because yeah. Haaland's run through, well... Refs look at it and go, that's because Harlem's yeah, fucking yeah, massive. Yeah, strong, yeah. One of the things with that, in, in a sense, is kind of, it felt like the media had an agenda against you. Mm. It was, was it around the 2006 World Cup? Yeah, well, it did. Maybe? You know, we, we've where it just about changed, that. where like everything was fine in the build up to that. And then there was just, oh, we've got to look at this player a bit more. Do you think yeah. me, the media plays a role in this? Yeah, well, we've talked about that. I mean, like there was a, I mean, it's common knowledge, you know, Graham Pohl, I think it was the 2006 World Cup. There was a, there was a meeting of the referees and they all had a meeting to discuss and they showed me as a... That's outrageous. As the, as the, as the clip. I think that's shocking. I think it, it does come from the English press and it comes from, you know, an idea of a competitive advantage, but it affects the World Cup. It affects England, and it's something that we think, as a community, need to do better at. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Like I don't, <clears throat> but it was like I was made a scapegoat. But yeah, the first sure. thing is, is like I was playing in that World Cup. So if a referee had, was watched loads of videos on me and <laughs> me fouling people or whatever, then obviously he's going to be quick to blow up in the game. And is that unfair? Maybe, yes, but, massively unfair. Um, but yeah, I had to adapt a little bit to my my game. What they should have done is played a video of Pele and go, now imagine Pele's nearly seven foot. <laughs> That's, then let's deal with these situations. Isn't that right, Peter? A seven foot Pele, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> so right. Here, Dave. right, should we do this one? This is uh, the Bernabeu. Real Madrid won Tottenham so, so nil at this point. We've talked about this at length. Exactly. I don't think we've actually looked at the footage. Oh, look, I dived in a little I, bit. I'm going to be honest. I don't think this is a red card dived, at all. I agree. I've it's dived. not a red card at all. I think you, you look at it in, you know, the first look in, in <sighs> the fast motion, it's not a red card. Again. You, you slow it down. There is a slight ray. It's a yellow card. Oh, Absolute yellow on. card. I, I've tried to... I didn't touch him really, did I? No, he's gone, he's gone down. He's dived. Marcelo Hold is a on. fantastic you, you footballer. Did, you did touch him, but you touched him on the foot. That, like he didn't touch him at no, the no, first point of celebration. That face that we've just stopped on there, that is, I have dived, I have won my team a, a, a you know a red card, well, what and now we're playing ten minutes. Shit house, yeah, complete shit house. Why don't you talk us through it? No, it's, it's just just stupid, really. Like it's naive. You know, I'm a thirty year old. You know, I'm I'm a little bit older now. I've, <clears throat> I've just been played by Ramos and Marcelo, who obviously experienced, but I was experienced. I played in World Cups. Like I should, I should have known better. It was ridiculous. Got a headline from from a paper. Peter Crouch wanted to punch Real Madrid's Marcelo after early red card celebrations. 
It does now. <laughs> I think that was a recent one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... He was, you know what, I love him. I met him on holiday, actually, Marcello. What a player. Uh, yeah, and a really nice fellow, like, nice family. It does feel the old, it, the way he's celebrating as well, it's mm -hmm. the classic, like, wink at the camera. Yeah, yeah, so, no, yeah. So he's, so he's, getting, he's getting me so long. And he's done it. And, yeah, and he's, yeah, he's worked, and then he's, you know, he's got to the final again, you know, that year. Did like, people you know, have a go at you? Did, what, what yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, remember, I remember sitting in the change room afterwards, and obviously that's a big cauldron, isn't it? The Bernabeu, and, you know... <laughs> I don't know, mate. Well, right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's very <laughs> steep, Chris, so it's like the fans it's are on steep, top of it each other. It feels like you're underground. I've never played them. <laughs> well, it feels like you're, you're, a, you're a kind of gladiator. When you go up, you feel like you're a gladiator going into, a, into battle, basically. And, you, you know, you can't just see of people just so high up um, anyway, obviously, I walked down the tunnel, and then you can hear the you know, footsteps of the studs coming down. And because obviously, I'm sitting in there, but I can hear goals coming in, so it's like you can hear the noise, and you think there's another one, it's another one, it's another one. You know, we're getting battered now, and it's down to me. So, when the lads come in, obviously, you stand up and I'm like, give them my apologies. Um, you know, so sorry, you've let us down, this and that. And you know, Harry's basically can't even look at me. You know, because he's so fuming. One thing there, so you didn't have a monitor, a TV monitor in the dressing room. You were literally, no, it was, was the noise. I was li listening, um, I was just listening to the noise. Just like, you know, you're just sitting in there, like quiet dressing room. And I'm just like that and I'm going, and I'm going, and I can just hear another. Goal, another goal, 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 Real yeah, Madrid. I love a goal go in. I'm like, oh no. What a, what a strange experience. Not many people can say they were in a in a changing room having to listen to the sound of the burner bar as golf was going. I, I'm I mean, knowing it was there your must fault. Be one hand, surely. But there were some good times. Obviously, that was a great season for for us. You know, we 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 got into the Champions League. You know, I scored the winner in the San Siro. There was lots of good parts of the season, but um, yeah, that I mean, that game really like. It hurt, it hurt me for a bit, you know, because it felt like we had a real chance to do something special. And I know it was Real Madrid and we might not have got through, but we might have done. And I always think about it. Yeah, so to any footballer that's listening to this right now that is in, I mean, maybe not even that experience, but it's that kind of getting over a feeling. Mm. Sounds to me frustration. Um, let I don't want to put words in your mouth, but so let people excitement. down. Yeah, um, yeah, let people down. I did, yeah. And, and like, I, you know, I... Um, I just, I just would have liked to have seen what have happened because our team was good enough to beat anyone at that time. You know, we had, we had hungry, young, like talented players all coming together. It was like when Porto won it, you know, or Greece win the. You know, it just, it felt like it was a team, like Aaron Lennon at playing his best football. Luka Modric was a player that we probably shouldn't have had anyway. You know, Gareth Bale was emerging as a one of the best players in the world, Rafa van der Vaart. You know, I was causing Gomez. trouble. Was awesome. We had Ledley King, Dawson. You know, we had good players in, in all in good positions and we were underestimated, you know? Do you, you know when Arsenal fans give, especially Arsenal fans, but maybe other teams as well, but Arsenal fans give grief to Tottenham, no trophies, all this sort of thing. It rumbles on and it becomes an increasing pressure. Yeah. And then that leads to player contracts and discussions and things like that. Are you saying that red card is the cause of <laughs> <laughs> and if you can cry that would be great for the podcast oh, well. yeah okay okay um I, i'm gonna say i don't believe that's the entire cause of the 30-year wait for a trophy <laughs> so we've spoken about your frustrations grouchy what about when your teammates get sent off we've got a game from 2015 where you lost two teammates to red cards one of them being parched yeah, I remember Ivy, didn't he slap him in the face? Affle has basically gone down. He's had a little bit of a... I think Craig Gardner's clipped him on the head. He's turned around and he slapped him straight red card. Yeah, it was silly, but it was like... I mean, you should, why are you getting sent off for that? You know, like literally like a little clip of the face. It's like, you just say, just grow up, move on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you mean the referee should have held back at that point? Well, I just, I don't think it's like... I know it's he shouldn't do it. In the letter of the law. Fine. Yeah, the move's done. And then he just the got ref, out. The ref could have gone, no, look, it's one each. We could book you both or none at all. Yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah. Just book them both. It's a bit stupid, that. How did you feel as a teammate of a, you know, a team that's had two players sent off? Well, it's such a difficult game after that. You know what I mean? And like, that's our two midfielders gone. Um, incredibly difficult to, to recover from that. I think, I mean, 
I'd like to know the stats on how many times <laughs> nine players have gone on to win a football match. But, you know, leave very, that with you for homework. Dave. Yeah, I'll have a little Get look. Some homework in, Dave. This next section of the podcast is sponsored by Brewdog, which only feels right seeing as we're sat in their pub, we're having fun on their slides, we're eating their chicken wings. Uh, um, <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's been a revelation. It's been a real like, game changer for us. I, I just think for a while we were in the same pub and we'd have the same complaints and we became aware that on the podcast we kept going like, oh, the toilets are blocked up again, <laughs> stuff like that. It, it took quite a while, but then this these guys came in and were like, well, you can do it from here. And we nibbled. We nibbled, yeah, and it's it's, it's been a it's been a real it's been a revelation, really, isn't it? <laughs> it has. And full transparency, they bring us beers. As I said, they bring us chicken wings. It's been a joy. Right now, we're drinking uh, pints of Punk IPA, which is now my new favourite. Do you reckon we could get a barbecue in here? It's something to aspire to, though. They haven't currently... They've got everything else except a barbecue in here. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. To be fair. For good reason. They're not complete. Uh, it's definitely something we'll try and influence with the place. Also, what I really like, Crouchy, was when we came in, um, the bit that we're recording, there's, and we've said this before, there's like a glass door at the front of it. So if you do come to the pub here, you, you'll... You might well see us recording the podcast, but you want to kind of keep it permanently just for the podcast. Well, I'd room. like to. I feel like, you know, we're doing a podcast here. We've got a couple of uh, hammers here, which I'm doing the old irons to. And now they're obviously <laughs> going to watch the match. <laughs> it's, this um, is the joy what I'm saying place. is I feel like, you know, obviously, you know, there's a few football fans come here, obviously, a load of West Ham <laughs> fans that I've... Um, getting a bit of abuse about now, and uh, but like they, I feel like it should be like a blue plaque on the wall. Personally. Blue plaque, blue plaque on the wall, and obviously the guys from Brewdog are, are, are listening to this. So we, it's thank you so much for hosting us here and getting involved with the podcast. But ideally, blue plaque on the wall, and and let us change the pictures up in here for the podcast. Make this Perfect. like a crouchy podcast room. That would be the dream. But we are in here drinking uh, Punk IPA. We're in the Brewdog Waterloo pub. It's quite nice because it's not... Um, we were quite closed off before. It uh, feels like we're opening up. Mm. We did compare it, full transparency, with the curtain at the front here to a window in Amsterdam. Mm. And it does feel like we're slightly performing. <laughs> yeah. um, but no red lights yet, Chris. We're here for your pleasure. Mm. So, <laughs> <laughs> so last podcast, we talked about... Um, punk footballers yeah. as well and we asked you guys listening to get in touch with examples of punk footballers now they could either be guys that you play with in your Sunday league team or professional footballers some of which you may have played with Crouchy and the best uh, examples or the ones that we choose will win uh, like a massive crate crate of 48 punk IPA we'll get that sent out to you um, you know alcohol or alcohol free whichever you, you fancy um, and nice, we've got some great say. examples, haven't we? We have got some absolute bangers. The first one from Simon Pryor, the king himself, no one more punk, Eric Cantona. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with that. I, I can go with that. We want to get him on the... We've said this for ages, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, he's on. A, I'm sure he's on a tour at the minute. And I really want to get him out. I want to get him on the pod. I told you the Cantona story about my mum, didn't I? I, yeah, I swear did. I did. You did. Um, so Cantona, weirdly, my mum does this one. Are you... Cantona's son? No, no. I'm Chris not, but, Cantona. Uh, my mum. Don't start that. But my mum. Um, <laughs> Chris Cantona. Better than BBQC. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> really? My mum um, doesn't really know anything about football, right? And we were once looking through these photos. She's got this album and it's at a wedding. And all the guys outside, you know, like a guard of honour, mm. the, you know, people throw confetti. So all these guys holding footballs. Turns out, she was like, oh, I was like, that's Eric Cantona. And she goes, who? And I was like, Eric Cantona. And she goes, oh, yeah, Eric. As if it's like she just him. a pal. And what, why does she know him? Well, it turns out she did a couple of years where she lived in Marseille, got to know, uh, like, some, you know, people there. He was a family friend, but he was just like Eric who goes and plays football. Mm. I was like, mum, I think you're, you might have been mates with Eric Cantona. So she's like, well, yeah, I've got an address for him sent a letter to him just saying, oh, my son's really into his football. He's a big fan. He was a, like, I knew him from Man United, obviously. And uh, next thing I know, I get this hamper in the post, like cheeses, all for my mum, and uh, a photo stained with cheese. But I've still got it. Like the corner of it is all like mouldy with che like where the cheese had leaked onto it. And it was like to my little English friend, to me, um, you know, best wishes, Eric Cantona. This is incredible. We've got to get him on the podcast. <laughs> One of the maddest stories I've ever heard, I think. <laughs> a cheesy photo of Eric Cantona. Sent my mum cheese. I couldn't believe it. And, and the signed oh. photo. But 
You know, he was more punk than that as well, wasn't he? Yeah, he was definitely punk, but Crouchy, that's got to be Chris Cantona. We've got to be honest, yeah, right? Yeah, he's sending yeah, cheese no. over. He's sending photos. No, you disrespect you my father, could be Dave. Eric Cantona's son. Yeah, and you're the son of a fucking computer, aren't you? <laughs> I am an AI. We have actually established that. I am closing on on being an AI and a robot. You know, Crouchy did the robot. He's trying to uh, impersonate. I am actually a robot. I went to Roland Garros, actually, last week, right? And uh, the, the there's a car in the hotel opposite Roland Garros. It's Eric Cantona's Rolls Royce that he's donated to wow. charity. Yeah, unbelievable. Leave that. What a guy. We'd love to get him on the podcast. And uh, if anyone's got links to Eric Cantona, it sounds a bit beggy. Mm. Um, we'd love to get him on. Just ask your mum, Chris. Dave. It's you, not you're happy picking, with you're picking, it. It's not happy you're with picking, it. I won't nibble because this, <laughs> this will be the next... Wherever Go I nibble on the cheese instead. <laughs> Shall we move on I've, to I've another punk, suggestion, I've Chris? Shall we get away, from, get away from Cantona? Other footballers. So Andy is suggesting Kevin Muscat. Just ask Neil Warnock. You could ask me if you like as well. I don't know whether he's punk or um, or just or just like psychopath. <laughs> it's a fine line, isn't it, with what we're talking about? I think. It's, it's, well, you know what I mean, yeah. Equally punk and hard bastard. That's yeah. another one as well. Oh yeah, he was a hard bastard. It's not Scary. all um, famous footballers that we asked this about as well. We asked for nominations. We've had so many of these. Um, Crouchy, I want to get your reaction to this. So this was from. Don't judge him by this. This was from someone called Carl with a K. Oof. So I nearly didn't want to play it to you just in case you ruled it outright. But do you want to watch this? It's uh, we'll hear him out. Should we have a look? It's kind of a Carl move, actually, in some ways. Um, it's called like a, f a flying kick, they've described it as, <laughs> in Sunday League. <laughs> do you want to talk us through what's going on there? Oh, my God. Have you seen um, Mean Machine? Yeah. Have you seen the keeper? What is he, the monk? <laughs> <laughs> so when the monk comes out and two puts someone in their chest, yeah. that's exactly what Carl's done here. Basically, the ball's gone. Um, this player's played it back, I think, towards the, the centre-back. Yeah. Um, has played it back, and the oncoming player hasn't even tried to tackle. It's not even like it's sliding across the ground. Has flown through the air. Uh, like double footed Allah, in the chest Cantona Palace it's Can brilliant Can Cantona Palace but that was only one foot like imagine Cantona Palace with a it, in two the air feet. with the two feet yeah. on the chest um, and it pains me to say it should we go with Carl with a K with this flying tackle which I'm not sure we should promote I don't know if we all. should be rewarding like two foot <laughs> I don't tackles. think we should either mate because it's <laughs> a, it is a, a horrendous tackle but clearly from a player that's punk enough to to do that so well, it just, we, I think you've just got to find punk, haven't you, really? If, if two-footed tackles qualify, then Carl's your man. Also, I guess there's something a little bit punk uh, from our side uh, uh, rewarding it to Carl's, who, frankly, we've given mm. a very hard time to. Yeah, they've had a tough time, actually. They've had a tough yeah. time. It's nice to oh, give well, back. let's give it to Carl. I, I, you know, I'm not sure we should be endorsing two-foot tackles, but we are. Um, and uh, in a way, we're just saying sorry to... I think it's more that. I, I think we shouldn't encourage that. I think I like the maverick behaviour of Cantona. I don't think we should go there. I think it's more that that's the punk side of things rather than this. But ultimately, it's Carl with a K. We've had a couple of punk IPAs ourselves. Finn Rebellious. Let's give some to Carl. Oh. Can, can we get Carl to call up the person that he's injured like you did with Cesc Fabregas to say, look, I'll give you a few counts. That's not very punk. And everyone's apologising at the moment. And I just think, you know, <laughs> I don't think we want to... I don't think we want to... Draw ourselves into that, you know. <laughs> well, I, I really enjoyed that pod. Um, I can't believe I'm saying this, but cheers to Carl. Yeah, cheers, Carl. For one, one time only, Chumbawamba, everyone. Chumbawamba. Chumbawamba.